Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 358 of the podcast. Thank you guys for tuning in. Today on the show, I talk with Larissa Warren about the research she's been doing into raw clays on Tambourine Mountain. This is in rural southeast Queensland, Australia, and there have been potters working in that area from the 1940s up until today. If you'd like to see examples of Larissa's work, you can check out her pots at ratbagstudios.com. You can also read her article, Wild Women, Wild Clay, which is in the most recent edition of the Journal of Australian Ceramics. You can subscribe to the journal or find out more at australianceramics.com. Before we get to that interview, I wanted to thank some of the folks that have been donating to keep this show going. We are listener supported, so I'd like to thank Kathy Hayward, Louise Court, and Michael Horror for their recent contributions. If you'd like to make a donation yourself, you can do so at talesofaredclayrambler.com slash donate. Also wanted to do today's Amico Community Cork Board, which is in support of the Savannah Clay Community's Sip Cup Show. The show will be all online this year and will be juried by artist Renee Lepresti. If you'd like to find out more information about how you can submit for that exhibition, go to Savannah Clay Community. Com. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. Well, first for the listener, can you explain where you live? Tambourine Mountain is, we're actually quite close to the Gold Coast, so people would recognise the Gold Coast with Surface Paradise, uh, a big tourist location. Uh, we're about 45 minutes in the hinterland. We're in the scenic rim region, so not part of the Gold Coast Shire, but very close. So we're really fortunate to have both. It's a semi-rural town. We have no uh, town water. We are all self-sufficient we have our own, you know, each home has its own sewerage system and we collect our own water. And um, so we have that kind of side of it. And there's quite a lot of farms um, and people have larger property up here. Yet, you know, 45 minutes for someone that lives in a big city, that's not far to go to, to head down the hill. Um, and we're about six degrees Celsius cooler than uh, everywhere else because of the altitude. But it's quite a, it's a, we have a long plateau, so about, I think it's about six kilometres long. Almost 6,000 people apparently live up here. There's a lot of, it's a tourist destination. It's, it's very beautiful, so rainforest. Um, the road that we go down, so there's about three roads to be able to get down to, you know, our town. Um, that road that's closest to us was only developed in the 80s in this side of the mountain. And then there's the other, there's two other exits which were a little bit older. So the population has really seen a bigger growth from the eighties onwards. I feel like a lot of your project is using wild clay. And every time I hear people developing roads, they always find clay, or at least in Virginia where I'm from, road construction means clay. Yes, well, it means that someone's done the hard work for you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and so we are, the reason why there is a huge wealth of clay up here is we're actually part of the Mount Warning Shield Volcano. So Mount, now Mount Warning is good 50, 50 kilometres away or so. So it was a massive volcano. A shield volcano is basically a series of mountains were developed around it. So we are the product of ash and lava and... Um, and, you know, obviously the water streams around for the valleys uh, uh, 22 million years ago. 
but yeah, definitely if someone has a bobcat or someone's done some of the hard work <laughs> for you, it's a really, it's a good way of sourcing that clay. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about how finding clay and having people around you that knew clay was present led you into a larger research project about potters in your area? So a backstory was I've always been quite fascinated with combining the raw clays with porcelain. I I really love texture and contrast. And I was invited to go out to one of Queensland's oldest clay pits, which is called the Feenies Pits. And that's in, it's quite in the middle of the town of Ipswich, which is just west of Brisbane. Um, And so I was using some of the clays there and I got to go out to those clay pits. And it was quite a revelation for me because I expected to see all this beautiful strata of clay. But, you know, it was just, you know, we... We source clay here in old mining areas. So the shale or the coal is what keeps the clay, you know, nice and, you know, in that pocketed area. And they're more like a football field, you know, and you can, you literally walk from one type of clay and go a few metres and then you go to another pit and it's a completely different clay. And so that was a really interesting way of learning by seeing that. And then... Uh, coming to Tambourine Mountain, we moved here two and a half years ago. And coming here, obviously, you know, most houses are developed or farms and you don't really know this. Um, And I actually really didn't know that there actually was much presence of clay. We have very, very red, fertile soil. We live on the edge of a cliff, so we have very rocky soil here, so no clay in our garden. Uh, it actually came about more, it was through research and through discussions with the Heritage Centre and finding out about artists. Um, And we have a very, uh, like a Facebook page, a group community page where everybody gets on and complains about, (laughs) uh, you know, someone's dog that's been doing something. (laughs) And I actually posted on that and asked locals if anyone had had any clay. And it was actually a fellow art teacher that said, we, we have it under our house. And that was kind of the very start of, um, you know, because that clay that I found at her house was so magnificent, was so transformative. It was the start of an addiction. Um, it was, yeah, and I, it's still probably my favourite clay because it starts bright orange and at fired at stoneware at cone 10, it's a deep, deep purple. What a great combination. It must be um, manganese in the clay, I would imagine, that's making that purple color. I know some of your research has been testing different types of clays. What are the predominant clays in your area? It depends on what area. If I'm north, south, east of the mountain, um, where the reddest soils are of the south part of Tambourine Mountain, that's the whitest clays and they are almost pure kaolin. Um, there's not a lot of plastic nature in them. It makes beautiful terra sigillata and, and great slips. And the way I found out about those clays was I was actually talking to some of the avocado farmers who told me about these hippie farmers that came in the 60s to get clay off their, you know, their farms. But they would always speak to me in um, terms of the great slips. So we actually have had uh, big landslides on the south part of the mountain, and this is because of these clays. So when it rains so much, you know, the kaolin, because it's such a fine particle, you know, you've got to, uh, as opposed to other like a terracotta, which is a more coarser particle, uh, yeah, so these clays would be incredibly slippery. And some hilarious stories about farmers looking in the distance and seeing their cattle moving down the hill wow. without their without their legs moving. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what did you do? And they said, I ran the other way because my legs started moving without moving. <laughs> um, so, you know, some big slips. Uh, so that's the white stuff. And then uh, Eagle Heights, which is closer to the top where we are in the middle, um, very iron-rich clays. and this this purple clay that we talk about i actually was interested because i heard some uh, some other potters advising me that perhaps 
there was titanium in with the iron and that's what could make that change. Um, so, yeah, I'm still, I'm still doing a lot of testing. I really need to send them off to actually be tested, analysed, um, because my tests are always just lots of firing, lots of shrinkage, lots of measurements. Um, and then the last clay, or well, one of the other clays I've found is terracottas, which is in the north part of the mountain and really lovely plastic uh, uh, clays, very difficult to settle and separate, um, but really rewarding. And they'll go up to cone nine. Uh, they'll bloat just past there. One of the things that's interesting about a mountain like this is that you can have a primary kaolin and terracotta relatively close to each other, you know, just a few miles from each other, which when we think about geologic history, we think in my mind, I think about, you know, primary kaolins being way up in the mountains and terracottas being way down the mountain. But what we're, this is the story of geology. Once things are laid down, they move because the earth moves. <laughs> so it's interesting how close in proximity all of these things are. Definitely. You know, going back to that the original, you know, orange clay that turned purple. I um, I got so excited by that clay that I went back to that um, art teacher and said, "Oh, you know, can I get some more?" And she was like, "Yeah, take it all because when it rains, you know, a, a homeowner doesn't like clay under their house." When I went back, I I dug in, you know, a similar area, but it would have been maybe about one meter because under her house was on an incline she's been built on the side of the mount you know side of the mountain and there's been excavation so it would have been perhaps a meter slightly higher up the hill but so close i developed that clay i tested it could not get any purple it was a lovely reddish brown but it was gone and i was there thinking have i fired it too high did i change the way i process this and, you know, when your brain gets really stuck, it really did take me a couple of tests to go, hang on, just remember back to those Ipswich pits. They were completely different clays in such a short little location to each other. Yeah. And so, and then, fair, yeah, and exactly I went right back and I went back to the original hole that I dug and got back to that purple clay. So when you think about this general region, you know, you're somewhat close to the beach. You mentioned to the Gold Coast, which is like a, you know, very famous beach area. You're up in the mountains. You're you're at elevation. How long did it take you before you realized, like, wait, if potters used to live up here, they must have had a really hard life? <laughs> because in the 40s and 50s, it wasn't as easy, I would imagine, to drive down the mountain to get wherever you were going. Like they were living, the, the potters that were there in this community before you were pretty remote. Yeah, they were. And there, there was a way to get to Brisbane. I've read some fantastic stories about how the one road off was North Tambourine and they actually, you know, got up at four in the morning and got on the Bullock and went down the, you know, had to go down the hill that way. They got on a train, you know, and it would be a two, three hour trip to Brisbane. But people did make the trip. And what is even interesting is the, the road that I drive down to get down to the coast, that's called Tambourine Oxenford Road. And it's been known to be open since the 80s. However, it was before that being fully operational by the locals who called it Build It, Your, Build it Yourself Road. <laughs> and um, they, they did that. And I think predominantly because there was no high school on the on the mountain and they wanted to obviously not send their kids to a boarding school so they were making that trip and they built it themselves and one of the artists that I researched um, uh, um, Mrs Agard she was actually on that committee she was on almost every committee <laughs> um, and I think that's hilarious so they just went well you know if you're not going to build us a road we'll start and then the councillor you know finally came in and put some bitumen on it and and put a few signposts up. <laughs> yeah. Can you give us a rundown of the, the very earliest potters that you've researched that live there and then kind of work us up to the present day? The way it all kind of flowed was 
I found that clay um, and which at that point we had the first uh, COVID-19 lockdown, which was kind of worldwide, you know, that was, was it starting in March, April when we started hearing all that. So the kids were home for a good eight weeks and my kids are still quite young. So I couldn't really spend my days in the studio, which is on the same property as us. So I started looking into this and I just started doing some uh, research. You know, you can go through Trove and the news newsletters and papers. So yeah, definitely just started doing some searching. And then there was a few contacts and one wonderful contact that has been such an amazing support is uh, a curator and researcher called Glenn Cook. We met a few years ago when this connection with the Ipswich clay, he'd actually judged one of my works in an art show and took um, interest and we kept a connection. And I spoke to him about the tambourine mountain clay and asked him who had, he had been a curator of the Queensland Art Gallery. And he had told me interestingly that he had um, written and exhibited put on a show of women potters from LJ Harvey School. So LJ Harvey was, um, he was originally a woodworker. Now we're talking in World War I in Brisbane. So it was the technical college there, which now has over years become part of the Queensland College of Art and Griffith University. So LJ Harvey um, set up a school in this technical college and had a lot of, uh, you know, being World War I, it was a uh, women that attended the school at night were obviously working during the day. And then there was probably more affluent women that could attend the daytime classes. But he said that through this research and he produced a amazing exhibition with a, another historian, Timothy uh, Roberts, the exhibition was called With Heart and Hand. And it was an exploration of, or this, these women's, uh, these women's pottery from 1919 through to the 40s or 50s, and quite a quite a few of those women were known to be using tambourine mountain clays, uh, and that was really exciting. Women that weren't particularly from the mountain, but there was one woman in particular called Isabel Morris, and she was uh, she lived on Tambourine Mountain with her sister Joyce, and they had their own pottery up here. They were called the Mrs. Morrises. They were uh, <laughs> never married. And their home was called the Poplars. Uh, I went to the Heritage Centre up here and they actually had some of the, the Miss Morrises work. And it was a beautiful, bright orange earthenware pots with a clear glaze and slip decoration. Um, and then the Heritage Centre actually found some old some in an old interview from the early 80s from Isabel Morris and that was when the research and the oral histories really started it was fascinating she so I found out that she was digging the clays from her backyard they had you know she talked about the kiln they had she talked about the nature of the clay which I completely identified she talked about the sticky nature of it how the the longer it aged the better it got she talked about hereditary potters, you know, like, you know, leaving the clay there for your children. Um, and just all those qualities that I was finding in the clays that I was finding. And so, of course, I had to find out this house and hopefully it still existed and it did. And I knocked on the door. <laughs> and luckily the new owners, um, a retired philosophy lecturer and his wife is a writer, so welcomed me in and we were talking I kept talking about this orange clay and he said well I don't know about that but I know a white clay and you know we went into the backyard and he was finding like little crumbs of it and I was just you know so happy about that and he was telling me about the wall they they, they too had been the house had been built in into the ground and the rainforest is right behind them as well and he was telling me about this clay and I was happy with these few crumbs and handfuls. And he said, look, come back soon. I'll, I'll dig, dig a hole for you. And it turns out their entire carport, which was actually, I think the Miss Morris has had built a 
built another like a studio or a space down there but they had to get rid of it because it was sinking (laughs) so when he said that to me I was like oh wow I know what's coming up next and he pulled aside some of that gravel and it was just a pure solid you know block the whole you know imagine four cars worth carport and it was all clay under there so uh, that was wonderful because to be able to get that much clay you know to to really develop and research and so quite a few bags full of clay and then the the going from what uh, Isabel Morris had said in those research notes I was also then able to go and find out about um, two other wonderful potters who were very, uh, so Isabel and Joyce were very quiet. Now, they were slightly the older potters. They were working in 1958. Uh, they they actually set up the first pottery studio. So people were visiting and I inter- I've interviewed locals that were visiting them. They can recall their characteristics, um, how they treated the children or you know or spoke you know they were kind of disregarded the kids a little bit I don't think they were quite interested in them um and just hearing the experiences of how the locals would visit them and then uh some known history was that we have a we have a street up here called gallery walk and gallery walk was one of the very first store owners was uh Rhoda Rushbrook she she um, would sell dried flowers and, you know, um, just some little paintings and artworks. Another lady came and worked with her in this shop and her name was Barbara Laws. And I was, and Barbara Laws is still living and I was able to meet her and, and speak with her and she was, she's great. She's great. Um lots of character, you know, and lots of fantastic stories. So this is through her oral uh, stories, you know, I started hearing about these ladies that used to get together and make artworks and clay together and they created the, well, it's now called, so this has continued, it's now called Tambourine um, Creative Arts. So um, Doris Agard, she lived uh, in a central part of the mountain. She was quite fun. She was a fundamental fundamental founder of this creative arts group. And women were going there and not just pottery, but they did have several kilns there. They were doing painting. They were doing needlecraft, all sorts. Uh, her very good friend, Frances Carnegie, who was probably the most well-known potter that joined them. She came up in uh, the late 60s and she actually, uh, Doris gave her some part of her land. So she actually built a house behind her. And the grandchildren have given me some wonderful stories about, you know, hearing them get together in the evenings with their brandy (laughs) and um, all the ladies kind of getting together. And they set up a, a... a workshop and a gallery, a community, like a learning space, really. So everybody was teaching everybody else. Um, It got so popular. So when Doris passed in the 80s, they had 100 members. And that's when the group actually uh, went to the council and got a different location because they were just working out of an old orange packing shed, um, which is still there. So that was even wonderful for the history, the research as well, is that I was actually able to go to that location, go in there and, and see it. And I went to um, saw Francis's old house and a lot of the Agards are still on the mountain. So the granddaughters I was able to interview. Um, and, yeah, some, some really wonderful stories. And also then through their notes, you know, asking them, you now most people don't remember if someone asked them, do you remember where your grandma used to go and dig her clay? You know, <laughs> that was not part of their, you know, they're not, that's not their cognitive memory there. Um, but, you know, I was able to glean some aspects and, and work out where was the major roadworks in the 50s and 60s. I found out there was a bauxite mine 
which is where my son plays soccer now. We always wondered why every time we went and played soccer, it was quite cold and it was it's like you're walking down into a swimming pool. Um, so, you know, all these little aspects. And then, yeah, working with the Heritage Centre. And so, of course, everybody knows somebody. So this is a year-long research where eventually I became the clay lady and at the local shops I'd have people walk across to me and, you know, start telling me them their stories yeah so it, it 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 was it just kept rolling through your research and, and the oral histories you were doing did you get a sense that most of the women were selling their work on the mountain to the local community or were these pots going to you know other parts of say brisbane or you know down into new south wales or other other areas of australia they certainly are everywhere now particularly uh, the, the Morris sisters' work, they were really quite prolific. I was quite surprised. You know, you can go, there's quite a few collector groups in Australia and, you know, most people will put their hands up and say they have, they called it tambourine cue pottery often. That's how they would sign it. Um, Frances Carnegie, her works are in galleries. Um, she, see, she's, she was very... Um, very well studied. She'd studied with LJ Harvey. She had travelled back over to England. She had gone to France for a scholarship um, to study ceramics. And she also studied in Melbourne at the, the Swinburne University, Swinburne University. So she was quite, very highly skilled. And, you know, I, I've spoken to some of their her neighbours that have remembered them, and this is interesting ways of finding this information. Um, and yeah, she was. She had even in her sixties, she had several kilns and several wheels, and was still working. I don't think potters ever really truly stop making, do they? I agree. <laughs> yeah, and but Doris Agard, as her grandchildren said, you know, she, I identified with her because. This is why I originally became an art teacher because I just wanted all the mediums. I wanted to try everything and I wanted to experiment with everything. And she was like that too. So she was, I think, a little bit impatient and just wanted to explore everything. But, yeah, I was able to go to the grandchildren's houses and, and touch the work. And interesting too where suddenly in the 70s the work suddenly was um, fired to stoneware and the decoration the decorations in the 50s and 60s were very influenced from um, the culture of the time. A lot of artists were drawing inspiration from Indigenous moffets and patterns. The 70s, as a lot of uh, ceramic artists were, were influenced by the Japanese uh, pottery culture and even Francis Carnegie's work that went from intricate, uh, lidded, earthenware glazed works suddenly became vibrant stoneware platters and very obvious influences I find that you know it's quite exciting to see that and her her nieces and nephews said her house was full of books of arts and culture you know they remember that very well so they said she always constantly had the latest you know, newspapers and articles coming about what was going on in the arts in the world. Uh, Doris Agard was finding we have an old a Zamfia theatre here and she was sourcing um, uh, films, documentary films, from the National Archives and the National Library in Canberra and having them up and having show, you know, putting on nights and theatre nights. Um, so they were, yeah, we, you know, going back to what you said to before about the isolation, yeah, they were, but these, as artists do, um, they, they crave stimulation and influence. And, yeah, they, you know, day to day you weren't going down the mountain to do a lot of things and you were, you know, it was quiet up here. Um, the mountain was known for its healing properties. So people from all over the world would come and stay here and heal after illness. Um, a lot of the residents that are here still are very quite, you know, some of them are in their late 90s and healthy, very healthy mentally, physically. Um, 
But yeah, so going back, the, the women were in an isolated way. Many of them were either widows or never married too. I found it really interesting that both Miss Morrises set up, uh, they owned property in the 50s. They, you know, they set up, um, you know, their own shop and they had a coffee shop and they sold their work and supported themselves. Um, and so did a lot of these other women, you know, um, and there was no men around. And one of my favourite stories that Barbara Laws told me about was one of the, one of the friends of the these ladies, you know, they would all get together for their very stiff brandies in the afternoon and she said she was very religious and every afternoon after a few drinks she would announce, I thank the Lord every day that he never sent me a man. <laughs> I get the sense that these women were in their own rights feminists, not that they would, you know, be called that, but they were liberating um, Doris and um, Francis were driving to Alice Springs in their little yellow, oh, I forget what it was, it might have been an old Datsun. Um, Australians will know that car. And, you know, that's that's a crazy adventure for the, you know, to go in the 1960s and they would have been in their 60s as well. Uh, that's That's several, you know, that's a good three or so days drive and that's in you know, roads that would have been completely isolated if they had broken down, that no one would have been coming and helping them. And so they took a lot of adventures as well. So, yeah, there was this isolation and I definitely identified with them at the time when we were in that isolation. Uh, but I think they were heroic in a way as well. So when you think about these women they were making a living. So they, you know, they were potters, they were artists, but they were also community members. Like you, you mentioned specifically, um, I think Miss Agar, you said she was on all the committees, <laughs> you know, so she was, you know, organizing, you know, theater nights, but she was also doing stuff with infrastructure, like trying to organize the roads. So wh- what are the stories you heard about them? Not as artists, but just as core members of this mountain community. The mountain was interestingly very divided. The people in the south part of the mountain didn't really come to the north. I think it was purely because of the roads. But when I hear stories of the locals, you know, the locals that grew up on the south side weren't involved in the north side. (laughs) You know, we're talking about it's a small area. Uh, But, yeah, no, um, Mrs. Mrs. Agard, she was um, a founder of the Little Theatre she was also, yes, part of the Build It Yourself Road. She, um, I know that Barbara Rushbrook, the, her son, who still owns her gallery space, apparently recently they found letters that she wrote to the council in the 60s, very irate and quite strongly penned letters about how she felt that the local Indigenous um, people didn't have um enough care and and thought towards them and and housing and public housing you know so these these women really did stand up for their community and um and tried to make it well they did they made it what it is now um i think that's what attracts me so much about this place is that you know we have diverse people here but yeah everybody may know each other's business but they also um pulling together you know just seeing what the heritage center does and how every tuesday um these people work towards saving this part of the tambourine mountain history it's it's lovely um yeah growing up on the gold coast you don't have that so perhaps that's what's attracted us about that but yeah these these ladies Look, I'm sure they could have, I've, I've heard stories about some harsh words they may have said about other people, you know, um, they, there was a lot of talk about, oh, she's too good for us, all this snobbery, and there was some really interesting kind of um, talk because that's what you get in, in groups. Um, but, yeah, I, I think it's quite commendable how they, they made a culturally rich town in a t- in a in a time where we didn't really see that, particularly in southeast Queensland, yeah. 
So let's pivot and talk about how this research project has affected your work. And first, actually, can you just describe in your own personal artistic endeavors, like what it is you're interested in about using raw clay? I think definitely that I am achieving a completely unique texture and color to to buying commercial clay. I love researching and experimenting and I find the journey itself just as enjoyable as the end product. I was always quite criticized when I was studying art at university, the fact that I wasn't ever really resolving a lot, that I kept testing and exploring. Um, I have to embrace that now and know that that's part of, you know, why I get to where I am. Um, but, yeah, I, I, the, the whole the journey, you know, from going to the site to talking to the people that own the property, you know, like from the terracotta, he's got a 10-foot, 10 10-ton 10 excavator, you know, and he digs it and he knows his land because he's excavated that and, um, and you know, the, the histories and the stories too from every person that, that knows that clay. So I feel like it's a privilege for me to then be able to take some and I always only take a few buckets at a time. Um, I work more consciously with it. You know, I work in, I work small. I don't produce massive pieces because I'm more conscious of waste. The other thing we have very limited, the electricity here is very difficult, uh, the mountain electricity. So we have solar and I try and fire just purely through solar. So it's, it's a footprint thing as well. Um, but yeah, those those clays, it's that transformation. I mean, that's why I loved porcelain to begin with. But then putting the two together and the contrast. Um, and then I strive to, so if people see my work, I, I absolutely adore working in the form of Nerokomi. So I love pattern work. And I layer these different clays with also sometimes I incorporate the coloured porcelain as well. And I try to being an old geography teacher I really like looking at those cross sections of the strata of the of the mountain the ge geological metamorphosis and you know like you were talking before about the, sh the shifting and that age and the time and that sense of place so it does it sounds really it feels sounds really <laughs> <laughs> sounds really a bit silly but I feel like I have a better sense of place I have a better belonging and these works are, are special. And if they make it through the firing, they're even more special. And in a way, this research project, it's, I'm sure you, you know, this has been a year's worth of work or maybe more. Um, but your process of looking at clay as a geological material and then making a vessel that looks like geological material started way before that. You know, so when I think of your work, like I, I read in an article, you'd said you very rarely glaze. Like you're really interested in raw clays that are coming, you know, that are uh, pushed together through that Nirakomi process. Um, so can you talk about wanting it to, wanting to make vessels that look like geological strata as an aesthetic choice? Yeah, well, definitely the patterns that I embed do. Um, I often pick quite simple forms to tell those stories within um but yeah I, I i hope to i think you know i want to see it more like i'm giving you a photograph or a painting or you know both, my grandmother was a, a painter and my first degree was in photography and i loved doing landscape photography um and so i i feel like in a way you know, pots and ceramics is just another medium. I may not hang around with the whole clay thing. It's that imagery. Uh, who am I? You know, I'm going to stick around with clay. I think it's pretty <laughs> rewarding. <laughs> but yeah, it's 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 telling that visual story, and it's it's abstract. But or hopefully, people can kind of flow with those lines and get that concept and feel like they're within a landscape as well. Yeah. There's a great article you did for, I think it was Pottery Making Illustrated, maybe three or four years ago, and you go through your process of building. Um, and you made these these beautiful bowls. They were, I think they were even photographed with like some ice cream in them. <laughs> They're mostly white. 
but then there's this strata that runs almost like a river, but it looks like a river of rock, the same way you, you know, look at geologic uh, clay deposits. And it's this beautiful mix of colors that go through white. So when you're thinking about composition, you know, because with Nirokomi, you're, you're making aesthetic choices. So how do you uh, choose compositions for a form like a bowl, something horizontal, as opposed to like a larger vase form, which is vertical? If the work is going to be used for food, you have to you have to allow the food to speak as well. You know, you've got to give it some space. Um, so design wise, I think that's why with those those um, they're hand built uh, slabware pieces. But I make a massive big block of clay and I put the nerocomi through it and slice it through. Um, but yeah, I feel that. Yeah, it has to complement. And they the the that uh, pottery making illustrated article was actually all about it. It, it was influenced by ice cream because I love ice cream, <laughs> <laughs> and I want to I want to pay tribute to ice cream by giving it a a, a lovely smooth you know <laughs> polished uh, porcelain dish to you know serve it upon. Um, uh, yeah, and then uh, another artist. Uh, coined my work as you know chaos in you know chaos and and I think there is as opposed to a traditional Narakomi artist that uh, the patterns are well thought out of they're very decorative uh, you'll see that my pattern making look pat, pattern making looks more haphazard and I do I cannot reproduce the same pattern and I don't really want to I want them, I know in the mind what I'm doing, but I also keep keep layering and keep thinking and then I'll slice in and see the pattern and I'll go back and rework it and then I'll use previous patterns and embed that into it as well. I feel that, you know, like I um, someone asked me, when do you know it's enough? Like because I keep building the patterns and I always say, well, it's always one too many, I think. <laughs> you know, it's like I've had that one too many beers. I've had that too many <laughs> slices in the Narakomi. <laughs> um, yeah, I the I would take days and days to make those blocks, and they're not even that big. But it's because you have to walk away from them and look at them. Uh, I want to dive into them a little bit. So, with it, when you're making a block in in the article, um, you mentioned that you can you know, make the block of clay with all these different layers of colored porcelain or, you know, stoneware, any, any, any clay you're using, then you can put it in a bag and then keep it for up to a week or maybe longer if you spritz it with some water. So can you talk about workflow? Like you've mentioned, or maybe before the interview, you mentioned that you have children that you're taking care of. Um, you know, you used to be a teacher and you still teach art. So, you know, can you talk about the kind of work-life balance and how studio time fits into that? Uh, I, I left teaching, so I've always been very fortunate. I was able to teach part time, so I taught uh, art, photography, media, a bit of geography and history. Um, yeah, I was very fortunate after my kids were born to be able to stay on part time. Uh, in um, I, it was after the Australian Ceramics Triennial in Hobart. There was some mid-career female artist talking and I sat there mm. and it just hit me straight in the heart and I came home and my husband looked at me and he said, you're quitting, aren't you? And <laughs> I did. And so I've been full-time for just over a year and a half now and because I've got that teaching experience, I do now, I, I provide workshops and I do professional development for other art teachers. We have no formal tertiary training in ceramics not for the last almost 20 years. So all our teachers, our art teachers, are walking into um, classrooms without any knowledge of ceramics but all the facilities. So I found a bit of a niche there. and I, So I really still love being in the classroom. But, yeah, normally I can have, you know, most weeks uninterrupted in the studio. Those Narokomi blocks can always be... Uh, you know, re-wet, you know, you can put a, I put like a car chamois around them or a sponge. I tend to use them all up though. I like to work from collections to collections. 
And so you'll often see if like you go through my Instagram feed or my website or my collections, you'll see, oh, she's she's in the blue stage or she's working with the greens or she's working with all raw clays and no colours because, uh, you know, I want to just rely on those natural pigments. So I go through those stages and I find it hard to go back. Um, I definitely say no to commissions where people ask me, can you reproduce this work? Um, and I know uh, hopefully other potters recognise this, my collections and the way I work is also surrounding about when I clean up the studio, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Sure. Like when you go in there and you realise, okay, enough's enough, I really need to give this a really good mop out and a clean up and then you go through all your bags of bits and pieces and sometimes you look at it and you go, I have no idea what that is <laughs> and you just put it in the reclaim bucket and you start fresh. So when you're using raw clays, as opposed to um, uh, glazing a surface, I saw that you sand things. You often like, well, I don't know if it's burnishing or actually sanding off a layer, and then you coat it with some type of sealant. So can you talk about that process of sanding to clean up the connections in between all these different clays, and then how you seal it, or what you seal it with? I sand in every stage. I really, like I said before, I find texture and contrast really important between the smooth porcelain and the texture of the, the, the raw clay and the minerals. I do add trachyte and iron, um, quartz. Most of the time if I can find them or otherwise I'll use minerals that some of the clay suppliers have nicely sent to me. So I will sand at the dry stage so when the work has been I dry in um you know like uh, broccoli boxes you know your vegetable mm. styrofoam boxes I'll dry my work for weeks in them slowly evenly then I will suit up wear a p2 mask and I'll go out to the property <laughs> and I'll I'll dry sand with a y wool and that really cleans up um you know, yeah, so I really want that white to be white and crisp and very thin. The work is very thin and translucent, so uh, they're strong when fired but very, <laughs> very fragile at that stage. I'll bis fire and then I will wet sand, so with a wet wet and dry sandpaper, uh, bis, uh, so high fire, and then I will sand again. Um, something I do which is this just like such a good little tip of you know you you buy your different sandpaper grits but don't buy that fine sandpaper grit just use the old one <laughs> that's worn <laughs> down and it's the same as the fine so yeah so there's three sanding processes so that's probably why I don't make a lot of work that's why people have to kind of wait for my collections to launch I would rather make less work and make it right and perfect then make an abundance of it so I don't even call myself really a potter all the time because I just don't make enough to be called that probably I saw that you cover it with liquid is it called liquid quartz yeah liquid quartz I'd never heard of that can you talk about what that is Anna Marie's gonna love me so Anna Marie's from Made of Australia now she is a force to be reckoned with she's a local Queensland artist and she uses, she, she sagifies works. Now she's worked out she vitrifies and hires fires first and then she uses only natural products. She uses uh, emu eggs and animal poos and snake skins and <laughs> eucalyptus leaves um, but makes beautiful patterns and she wanted it to be restaurant wear and knew that it wasn't food safe. Now this is a lady that doesn't like being told no, so she went and um, did a lot of research and uh, came up with this product and it's now, I think, being sold worldwide. If my work was just purely porcelain and vitrified, I don't think I have a problem with selling that. That's food safe, you know, uh, but because I am putting in the raw clays and, I, you know, I even though I test those clays to be vitrified, every batch is going to fire slightly different. So uh, she developed this liquid quartz seal, ceramic sealer. It's food safe. It's, it is nanotechnology. 
um, it doesn't change the it doesn't change the matte or the gloss of the work. So it is to be put on, um, yeah, unglazed surfaces. And I mean, I've had pieces that have been in the dishwasher. I know she's she's supplied her work to Sydney restaurants, and they've had their work. Her, her plates in the dishwashers, you know, for years and years and still the water's beating off them. So it's a great product. And, yeah, I don't use glaze mostly because I really want people to keep touching that surface that I've created and I don't want to cover it up. Well, I wanted to wrap up going back to the original research you did of Tambourine Mountain. You've recently had an article that was in the Journal of Australian Ceramics, so I just wanted to plug that. Can you uh, tell people how they can read that article? Uh, you can go to, so Australian Ceramics has a fantastic Instagram and Facebook sites and the link to buy the article that is there. Um, yeah, it's it was really exciting to write for them because, and also to get the front cover and the back cover. Yeah, congratulations. Well, that's my son's picture on the front, and he's he's quite chuffed with that, that they picked <laughs> his. Um, <laughs> I was photographing the pots which went on the back cover, and he came in. He's He was seven at the time, and he saw my test tiles, and he stacked them up, and he said, take a picture of this, and, yeah, <laughs> he's not let me. You know, every time he sees the magazine, he goes, there's my, there's my picture. <laughs> <laughs> um I spoke to Vicky um, Grimmer, who's the the editor and um, amazing artist herself, and she's actually one of the 12 women that I ended up sending the the clay to. So that was the other thing is that I actually in my research discovered that Tambourine Mountain Clay was was well known and there were some uh, newspaper articles or adverts asking women to share these clays even back in, I think it was in the 50s or 40s. And I thought that was fascinating. And then, you know, we were in lockdown at the time and there was that isolation and I needed the connection and I was doing all this research. I created a bit of a blog and I just shared it privately with these women that I connected with. Um, And then I said, you know, can I send you some clay? I want you to play with it and test it. And they all work in completely different ways to me. And it's been really exciting. We're hoping to do a regional touring show. Um, I'm still trying to organise funding for that. Um, But, yeah, each of them have brought out their own, you know, there's nothing but, you know, I can test and test these clays, but then if I send you some, you're going to come back with me and go, hey, Larissa, I did find that there's manganese in that clay or did you realise that, you know, when you did this to it or have you made this glaze from this oxide from it and yeah so uh it's fantastic we've got 12 different women working in different approaches and it's it's i've got a little club to keep me company uh so yeah uh, they were they were along for the ride so the article is in the latest um journal of australian ceramics um i've had some wonderful feedback from potters you know well-known australian potters that i so admire um it's it's been an absolute privilege yeah can you leave your website and social media so people could get in touch if they wanted to buy work or ask more about the project so it's ratbag studios (laughs) (laughs) that's an old nickname from my husband from many many years ago uh so it's yeah it's the website's uh, ratbagstudios.com and i have quite a lot of information there. I actually have some of that blog that I put on the journey of the wild clay and uh, an education component to that. So some of those articles that we talked about are there for people to see. Um, my Instagram, I'm mostly on Facebook. There is one, but I'm not on it enough. But Instagram is a great way of connecting with me, uh, which is just right back studios. Well, thanks for uh, taking the time to do this interview and, and taking your morning to do this interview. Oh, absolute pleasure. I I um I don't want to listen to this interview, but yeah, like I said before, I, I listen to your podcast in my studio, which is a underground bunker, and it's quite, you know, lonely sometimes and it's just great listening to your conversations. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. I'd like to thank Larissa for taking the time to do this interview. 
It was a pleasure to chat with her. Before we go, I wanted to do one more plug for today's Amico Community Corkboard. That's in support of Savannah Clay Community's Sip Cup Show. The show will be all online this year and will be juried by Renee Lepresti. And you can find out more information at savannahclaycommunity.com. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you guys for tuning in. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support.